This is At Your Service, the service management podcast from CRM Audio, with your hosts, Sean Tabor and Scott LaFonte. Kingsway Soft is a leading integration solution provider offering software solutions that make data integration affordable and painlessly easy. Thousands of enterprise clients from over 70 countries and regions rely on Kingsway Soft to integrate their data with various business systems in order to drive their business efficiency and fully leverage their information assets. Kingsway Soft is a leading provider of Microsoft Dynamics integration software, including Dynamics 365, CRM, AX, NAV, GP, SL, as well as many other applications, such as Marketo, Dropbox, QuickBooks, and Salesforce. Whether you need one solution or several, Kingsway Soft works easily within the SSIS platform to make your integration processes as quick and easy as possible. Many of their clients have seen three to 10 times greater data integration performance after switching to the SSIS integration platform. We thank Kingsway Soft for sponsoring this episode of At Your Service. Okay, welcome to another episode of At Your Service, the service management podcast on the CRM Audio Network. As always, I am your host, Sean Tabor. Um, today's a special episode, not like one of those after school specials on ABC when we were little, you know, a very special episode, not, not like that. It's more, um, the last few episodes, we've been talking a lot about functionality within the system, talking directly to that. Um, that's been banter between myself, Scott LaFonte and, uh, Yvonne Kurtev today. I personally am going to have a little more fun in this episode. Um, one, because Scott and Yvonne aren't here, which is great for me. But uh, we're going we're gonna to interview the Dynamics 365 diva herself, Sarah Jelinek. I Sarah, am how fabulous. Are you doing? Sean, how are you? I am wonderful. So we're, we're fresh off the uh, CRM UG Summit euphoria. Um, how are you doing uh, from, uh, uh, it was, it was a blast. It was exhausting, which is the way it should be. So much information to share with people, so much information to learn and so many opportunities to network. I am still recovering from that and going to bed earlier, getting up later and, uh, just wish it was, it was back again, but, uh, it was a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And you know, what's, what's great is when you're in those sessions and you're talking to folks, um, it's crazy how when they come up to you and they start, I still don't get, I'm still not used to this. When you do a presentation and then they come up to you and ask you more questions, I always go, wait, why are you asking me these questions? Well, it's because I just showed you that I knew stuff about it <laughs> and I should really realize that that's okay. But it's kind of, it's just kind of weird. Total strangers saying, you know, Hey, you know, and it, it's exciting because you know, you're helping people real time and it's absolutely, it's, it's um, I was, I was, helping manage the hands-on labs and, and people came in from my sessions that were there because they knew I was in hands-on labs and they came up to me and said, okay, let's talk more about the automation that you just showed in customer service with case creation rules. And, and, you know, we just took a deeper dive while we're sitting there in front of a machine that had Dynamics 365 right there for us to demonstrate how they could implement those changes in their environment, yeah. which was really neat to have that capability at Summit to share that information. So you do a lot of service-based uh, sessions at Summit and at other conferences that I've seen. What 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 drives you towards the service aspects? Uh, That's of a the, great question. Um, I, I realize I've been a part of uh, involved in customer service really all my life. Uh, both my grandparents, uh, both sets of grandparents, own grocery stores, and as a child, you get to uh, help out a lot of times in in ringing up customers, their purchases, taking out their groceries just providing service. And all through all through my high school and college, I, I worked in customer service organizations. I worked as customer support for Microsoft, as well as a smaller company in my home, um, my current home, Fargo, North Dakota. And I've always been involved in service and customer service and finding out ways that I can help better serve my customers, get them the information that they need or the services they need. And I guess it's something that's always been, you know, kind of ingrained into me is, you know, since I was a child of, of providing that. And when I saw customer service in Dynamic CRM 3.0 at the time, I'm like, I've lived this. I've been that support person 
taking those calls and I've felt the pain of something not working right or needing readily, you know, readily access inf to information and not sometimes having that. What ways can I make that better for my fellow support staff or myself or even people that are going to be providing support that I'm going to help implement this for? So I think it kind of just struck a chord with me to say, hey, this is this is my niche. I, I like to provide you know, as much tips and tricks that I've learned from my times sitting in the chair, answering the calls, or um, you know, being in the front line with the person right in front of me and providing support and help to them in that aspect. So I think it's really struck a chord with that. And, and a lot of our implementations that we're doing right now, um, some of them are focused around customer service, call centers, providing phone support. So um, I got a, a lot of wonderful experience from that as well. And, you know, and that, that's that's awesome to hear because the service components of Dynamics 365 are really, to me, where the rubber hits Absolutely. the road, right? I mean, it's that's where that's where people are actually getting mm -hmm. help, right? I mean, there you could you could say from a sales context or a marketing context that people are getting a message that they may not have or they're getting a product that they that they need. That's all fine and good, but the whole point of the service objects in Dynamics 365 are to solve a issue Correct. or need, yes. which is very powerful. So, yeah, I, I agree. I, I've I've done a ton of customer service uh, work myself. I haven't loved it all. <laughs> I, I I won't lie to you. I haven't loved it all, but. Yeah, it, it's that is that is something that uh, it's great when you can leave an implementation from my perspective and know that you've just given that customer tools that, to where they can not only help their customers better, but gain metrics on how to even improve their processes Absolutely. more. So that's yeah. really cool. If you have the that's opportunity really cool. to just even take 10 seconds off their processing time when they're working with the case, but yet still provide that level of customer service they want. I mean, that's a victory right there. You think 10 seconds isn't a big deal, but, you know, if you're in a call center, you're working with people day to day, um, you know, you want to try to serve as many people as you can, as efficiently as you can, but still keep that that personal touch. Um, you know, there's wonderful small little victories like that that make it worthwhile. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, when when you go into an implementation, and you're looking at how they're going to implement service. Have you had one of those those aha moments where where something has just jumped out at you and, and said, you know, go this way, and you that you may not have thought before, um, and and found a new way to to solve a problem that you've maybe used in other implementations after? Yeah, there's actually a great example of that um, working with a, a particular customer, they. Um, they use knowledge management quite a bit. So they have their knowledge articles that they uh, they compose and they have that integrated knowledge management, um, embedded knowledge search within Dynamics 365. And that was a great feature for them because it could provide that information. But one of the things, uh, one of the challenges that we ran across was sometimes we needed to send that information out to the customer. And of course, you, you can send an article through email using that feature, but a lot of times there was a need to actually send out a notice, a, an official notice document uh, from their organization. And uh, we ran into a challenge with that because, you know, a lot of people might have that document stored locally on their machine um, or in a shared drive that they're grabbing and uh, they're inserting or attaching it to their emails that are outgoing to the customer. And that's fine, but you sometimes run into the challenge of, do I have the most recent document? So one situation that we ran into was, how do we find a nice central location for them to put their information that they have version control to say that this is the latest version, this is the one that you're going to use, and let's have you send that. And um, I'm I'm kind of a hobby developer. I'm not uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of dangerous, but I don't uh, I don't do it regularly. So I went to one of my developers and said, well, how about we utilize the sales literature feature in Dynamics 365 because you can upload the files there. You have one person that will have control over it. And let's just add a lookup field to an email so they can go grab that sales literature document and he can then use a plugin to pull that attachment, add it to the email so that uh, they can easily send out that information. And that little 
process really cut down the amount of time for someone to have to go out, click like seven times to go browse out to that file, attach it to the email, and send it out. And that way they have the most recent document, someone's managing that information, and uh, it just really cut down on that processing time and made sure that they can send out that information seamlessly. And after that, I was like, wow, why are we not utilizing this in many other areas? So that's something that, uh, that we look at implementing when people need to email from a customer service standpoint of sending that out. And they're utilizing just out of the box, using the web client, no uh, app for Outlook or anything. So that, that I think it was a really great feature for us to implement. That's a great story. I mean, that, that really that really can, I can see how that can very quickly for a customer show value and, and functionality that they may not even have thought about having, ha having in their uh, arsenal without Outlook. Mm -hmm. So that's really cool. And, and uh, could you, can you extend that as well and use the um, Outlook uh, app, the app for Outlook and insert the literature that way too, or it, does it not work? Yeah, that so way? in the app for Outlook, you do have the capability when you're composing a message to somebody um, that when you track it, you can actually insert sales literature as well. So if someone was utilizing, um, you know, just their, uh, their workstation didn't happen to have the web client open, saw an email, wanted to send that information out, you can attach sales literature there as well. And of course, utilize your email templates, um, which is a huge time saver for a lot of people. Cool. Let's take a step back. I want to ask you, because I know I have my own story about how, um, how I came about calling myself Serum Hobbit online, essentially my brand. Mm -hmm. So how did you come about Dynamics 365 Diva? Because knowing you, you don't come across as a diva. You're 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 one of the nicest people I know. So so tell me how that that originated. That's that's funny because you know when I when I was talking with the individuals that helped me come up with this name, um, I said that's so not like me, and they're like that's exactly why you need the name. And I think diva tends to get kind of a negative connotation sometimes, like you're kind of a brat, yeah. you're uh, kind of a snob, you have to have things your way. And, and really what Diva is, is it's really just the, the, the female star of the show is really what it is. Um, and and okay. I, I can Wikipedia that and just make sure I've got that right. Um, <laughs> but I came up, we came up with the name because when, when Microsoft decided to, uh, you know, to change the labeling from Dynamic CRM to Dynamics 365, that was just kind of a given mm -hmm. that I was going to go that route. And then the Diva name, trying to find a name that just to kind of stand out. And uh, a group of uh, friends of mine, uh, they're all CRM experts. Um, and we get together once a year at our, what we call the Women's International Networking Event. Acronym is WINE, mm -hmm. of course. Um, we just kind of, they were talking one night, drinking <laughs> drinking glasses of wine, and we came up with that name. And I said, all right, let's do that. That sounds good. So it's, it's a unique name that hopefully people don't forget. But um, and hopefully they don't have that perception of me ahead of time before they meet me that, uh, that I'm not quite a diva like most people think they would be or that one would be. Well, I could, because I have followed you on Twitter before I met mm -hmm. you and, and I didn't think you were like, you know, snooty or anything from your <laughs> tweets. I thought you, you know, you shared some good information, but when I met you, I was like, oh my God, this is not a diva at all. <laughs> She's so nice. So... You know, it, but no, it, it's, it was, it's, I liked it because I, it was easily rememberable. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, 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 it comes off the, uh, tongue real nice and, and it's, uh, I think it's a great brand. Um, we, we just, uh, like for me, for the, the serum Hobbit, it was just something, like you said, it was something that would make people think and say, Oh, what, I wonder what's going on there. And it, even if it just gets them to click once, mm -hmm. it's worth it, right? Yeah, I absolutely so, love your your brand, CRM Hot, but that's awesome. Well, that <laughs> that happened when I was uh, working for a financial services firm, and uh, I actually got a, uh, a nickname of a, of an angry Hobbit. Oh no! <laughs> and um, yeah, so so, but I was working on um, a three O implementation uh, with Chuck Ingram. Okay. Uh, from Tribridge now. And uh, he was he was my uh, Microsoft solution guy, you know. He was from uh, Microsoft Services, okay, and um, or MCS. And uh, and he goes, man, you're you're just like a CRM Hobbit. <laughs> I'm like, hey, there you go. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> let me write that down. So yeah, 
So, um, you know, we we did a little we did a little something. We um, put it out there on on the tweets, asking for uh, questions for the diva, and you know, I got some. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but uh, can we sure get the same time? See, now this is not going to be a uh, stump the diva. Uh, segment. All right. That's, that's not what this is intended for. This is simply to showcase your knowledge. You know, maybe get some insight. All right. And uh, there, there's uh, I have uh, three or four folks that have asked some questions. Some, some from a functional side. Okay. Some from a more theoretical side. And some, dare I say, it's it's more almost a metaphysical question. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's happening. So so we'll we'll let's let's move through some of these and, and see see how it goes. All right. What do you think? Let's do it. All right. <clears throat> okay. So the first question comes from Ashley and she asks, How do you see cues helping your customer service department improve their response times? That's a great question. Um I was actually just working with a customer the other day and we were talking about you know, the capability of, of Dynamics 365 and, and integrating uh, with other platforms like social media and being able to mm-hmm. to gather information um, that's out there. If, if people are, are complimenting our brand or our, our products or our services or our organization, great. But if, if they are, um, you know, complaining about it or frustrated or it had a horrible experience, um, you know, we want to gather that information as soon as we can. And I can see a great example of where cues uh, will help us kind of isolate those those special issues. So obviously taking information in from social media through social engagement, you know, ca- creating cases on those negative tweets and, and putting it out there for people to see. Now, if everyone's looking at your active cases view, you're going to, you know, see a lot of information potentially. It's almost like drinking from the fire hose. But with sure. Dynamics 365 and, and, and earlier versions Dynamics CRM, we've got these concepts of routing rules that say, all right, if a special condition is met, if this is high priority, if there's a negative sentiment value on the on the social activity that was um, included as part of this case, you know, let's put this into a queue, into a special bucket, a special inbox, special container, so people can see that we've got uh, kind of a, on fire issue here for people to, uh, for our customer service representatives to just jump in and respond to right away. And the idea behind that too is that, all right, I've got this this kind of service board in, in the form of a queue that I'm seeing all these cases out there. Um, we know that we have, a, we have the capability for five or six people to look at the same record at the same time. But with queues, mm-hmm. the capability to say, you know what, I'm going to take this. I'm going to pull this out of the inbox. I'm going to work on it. And the, the capability to say that I'm working on this and taking it and have that no longer appear as an available item is going to ensure that every case gets its attention, that not more mm-hmm. than one person is working on the same thing at the same time, and that if it ends up being where I can't handle it, I can release it and maybe route it to somebody else to take care of. So really just make sure that we're using our time efficiently and we're grabbing the cases that we need to handle with a higher priority uh, for those that are low priority, we still need to keep an eye on those and make sure that they're getting the attention as well. So to get an idea of you know what's been sitting out there the longest and how can we take care of our customers best. And and they're great for escalation as well. Absolutely, right? yes. So so if if you if you have a case that uh, either an SLA is be, being missed or you have attribute values of a certain type that mm-hmm. can automatically generate that escalation and route that to a, a queue. I have found in my experience that doing that as opposed to firing off, you know, infin- infinite number of email notifications, which then right. become ignored and go into spam uh, yes. is extremely powerful. It, it doesn't right. take long for people to create the rules and outlook that says, I'm just going to throw this notification into the, into the deleted items Not, because it gets no, to be I too don't. much. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then once you have that rule, you just copy it. Yeah, <laughs> you just change the criteria. So very easy, very easy. All right. See now that wasn't too bad, right? First question. No, I, that's, there we bad. go. All right, all right. Here's a, our next one's from Joel, and uh, he asks, "What are, what do you think of the lame subject tree, and would you recommend people use it?" The lame subject tree is that what Joel said? 
That's what Joel said. Okay, so just making sure I got the right phraseology for that. Yeah, for those out there in the audience who may be not familiar with with subject, let's talk a little bit about subject first, and then then uh, tell them what what you think of it. All right. So subjects have have been around since I know since version 3.0. That's when I started yep. with Dynamic CRM, and it is just like Joel says, it's a subject tree. I'm not going to say the word lame because it served a great purpose for us when it was there because that was all we really had, right. um, besides creating a custom entity for things, and it's. Think of the concept of I've got a tree and I'm, I'm going to have high level categories like is this regarding products? Is it regarding service? Is it regarding maintenance? Is it a, just a query? And underneath each of those little tree or branches, we can actually have s- smaller branches. So, for example, if it's a question on a, um, a, a query, is it a sales query? Is it service? Um, is it a f- accounting query? You can actually use this to help, you know, in a way, categorize your records and Subjects are not only used in customer service, you can use them for your um, articles, uh, you could use them for your products, um, you can also use them to help categorize uh, sales literature, I think, as well. Mm-hmm. I used to know this by heart, so because I uh, obviously teach uh, people to prepare for exams, so that's one of the four things I try to remember. But subject tree is great uh, because you can actually have a nice kind of you know, branching logic to you know, how you should categorize your cases. The one challenge that subjects provided us was if something was um, no longer used. Um, Like, for example, we don't support Windows 2000 anymore, uh, Windows 2000 workstations. We don't support Windows XP anymore. What do we do with that subject? You can't really retire it in terms of deactivating it or deleting it. So that posed a challenge for us. And that's probably where I'm thinking Joel's coming up with that lame name for it. Uh, so you probably could rename it and say, you know, do not use. But, you know, if someone says, see something that says do not use, they might want to use it anyway. They don't they don't right. quite listen to you. So the uh, concept of categories, I think, is uh, is a really good one that we've started to implement more when we're helping to categorize our cases. Um, the capability that we can have kind of a parent-child structure with that as well. We have uh, much more flexibility to e- easily move cases over to that other subject or category. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's just a little bit easier because you can actually deactivate one and say, you know, we're not utilizing this anymore, but, you know, we're still keeping it there for historic purposes that we don't want people just to see that or choose that when they're working within the system. So with that answer, I would say that um, if I had the opportunity, which now we do with Dynamics 365, I would always go with a route of categories and perhaps not utilize subject anymore. Okay. And it, this one thing that I always ran into with with customer feedback on subjects was you know how you have the parent child Mm -hmm. they like they want they always wanted to be able to see the parent and the child so they can understand the context and if they had uh quite often they had uh child subjects which were the same in multiple um under multiple parents yes so and by choosing it that didn't tell them the information that they had. So we had to then append the values and make them longer. And yeah. Right. So. Yeah. And, we, and we've had it where we've actually had to just pull that parent and populate that in a field for people to see right. that. And then for reporting purposes too, it's, it's not easy to grab that if you're using fetch XML or just out of the box reporting to just say, Hey, show me that parent category. Right. You have to do a little bit of magic in your, in your uh, fetch XML reports to do that. So branching off of that, if you're starting out and creating a, a category or using the subject tree, how would you go about starting out with that? How would you go about, you know, uh, talking to your client about that that initial creation? Because I've had it to where customers can ask for, you know, 50, 60 different subjects in a tree mm-hmm. right off the bat. And if there's not legacy data, to validate that those are going to be used, it can be, you know, daunting visually. Yes. So yeah. how, what, how would you, how would you uh, go about recommending people do that? I think we always start off with just saying, start small, you know, look at the, look at the big items that you're tracking right now. Um, you know, if, if uh, one of our customers has four or five different departments and, um, you know, each of those departments might receive different inquiries and would say, let's just start off with, with just categorizing, you know, which department does this really pertain to, um, you know, their their particular category. And then, um, you know, think of 
you know, some of the some of the higher level items. Uh, one example was they had five different departments, and they had each of these uh, departments had an office in all 50 states. So then they wanted to say, all right, so we've got department one, and then we've got their offices in the 50 states, and then we want to track 10 categories underneath that. So if you think about it, that's 500 categories that we would potentially end up with, you know, if you're thinking about that type of tree. And I think you just kind of have to guide the discussion to say, okay, if there's something that's repeating itself a lot, in this example for us, it was the states. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe we look at um, utilizing that that categorization somewhere else. Maybe we have another field on there that says, you know, what state does this pertain to? Not necessarily putting it into the categories, and and you could still provide the reporting on that. I think if you start to show them examples of, okay, great, we've got this really detailed subject or category, you know, category tree that we're building, um, look at the different iterations of reports that you're going to have with that and, and managing that. And then also when it comes down to it is, is categorizing your knowledge articles as well. Because um, we utilize that feature with, with knowledge articles to say that it's pertaining to, to this particular subject or category. Um, do you want to get that granular with that information as well? So I think you're just kind of letting them see the big picture of, of how you can get too detailed with that. Mm -hmm. Man, that's a good answer. That's a really good answer. <laughs> and, and it makes me think of another question. All right. So in terms of KB articles, mm -hmm. do most companies that you've worked with, do they have a specific person or set of people who write their KB articles? Or do they have a broader set of people write them and then have a approval a, an approval process um, to, uh, to move through before mm -hmm. it's published? That's a great question. We actually have um, we have a mix. So right now we have a customer that um, they have a team that's responsible for the content. So people can provide suggestions. They might send an email to an email address and say, "I've got a I've got an idea for a suggestion." Um, actually, one of the sessions that somebody talked about this is, you know, if they run into an interesting case that uh, they've been working on, they think, "Oh, this is a tough one. This was not an obvious answer, but I think we need to keep this for future use." you know, flagging, um, flagging a case to say, hey, we need a knowledge article created on this so that their their content team can come interview that, that service representative and get more information. But a lot of times it is one sole person or, or a small group of people that will be responsible for the content. Now, it's a combination of they can have people create the article, type up the information in a rough format, and then that one person or that group of people will actually look at the content and then go through the approval process to say that this is right, this is matching our company policy, this is the formatting we want to use, this is the language we want to put in there, make sure our disclaimer is in there as well. Um, so it is it is still a collaborative effort throughout everyone in the organization, but it does come down to having a few people with, with that standard voice and standard language that they want to express in those knowledge articles that finally decide on that content. Yeah, that's always been a struggle for a lot of my customers, um, especially mm -hmm. before, um, what was it, 2016, when we got the the new the new KB authoring tool um, and the yep. approval process. It was it was um, it was difficult to really articulate well to them if they were brand new to this concept on how to best move through this because. I, I have seen where this has often been kind of adopted by the marketing team when it's not necessarily marketing, but then right. then they want to start putting their marketing documents in it, and you have to have that conversation. But well, that's actually sales literature, and yeah, it's it, it it's definitely different for each customer for sure. But uh, mm -hmm. it, it's nice now that we have the tools to enable an actual approval process to whether it's one or multiple people in the, in the process, it can be managed pretty seamlessly. Yeah. And, and one thing too, and when, when we usually talk to people about knowledge articles, um, one, one in the group that I worked with, this is, I, I love that they have this built into their plan is that they actually set up a schedule like every quarter, mm -hmm. they have someone that will go through their knowledge articles and make sure that they're still valid, that the policy is still true. Uh, the content is still relevant. Mm -hmm. And if not, then they'll eventually retire it because a lot of a lot of time people will go and create a knowledge article and, and it's it's kind of like the the wrong co where said it and forget right. it. 
and not come back to it. And you're going to end up with a lot of a lot of information that you don't need in there. And it's frustrating for your service representatives to go, I don't care about CRM 1.2. We don't have this anymore. No one's us- utilizing it. Why do we still have an article coming up on that? Just as an yep. example. So, uh, you know, be building that into your plan to say, okay, let's, if not once a quarter, at least once a year or twice a year to go in and, and look at that content and make sure is this still valid. It's just good business sense to do that because otherwise you have people sending mm-hmm. out stuff that's, that it's going to be a more of a detriment than a help, right? So. Absolutely. Um, okay, you ready to get metaphysical? Because we have some metaphysical All questions. All right. Um, this comes from, uh, from Sarah C. in the UK. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I know who that is. <laughs> yes, uh, she she asks, um, what what kind of fruit would you be, and why? Ooh, that's <laughs> a great question. Um, I like this question more than the you know. Before, I, I, but, yeah. the, I think the yeah, this is great. I think the first one is is a pineapple. That's the first one that comes to okay, my mind. So why? Um, why? Um, I guess I get a nice, tough kind of exterior. Don't don't uh, don't pick on me too much. I'll get it. I'll get to you. But um, you know that uh, it just, there's just sweetness all around inside. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I figured yeah. you'd like that, and she would like that, just because uh, I, I hear apparently how yeah. nice I am. So I, I got to keep up that well, reputation. And I guess. you live in a tropical climate. So that's not bad either, right? Yes, Fargo, Fargo, North Dakota is really yeah. tropical. Yeah, I don't think Absolutely. many pineapples grow in uh, <laughs> natively in Fargo, but um, no. So that's why they're extra exactly. special, right? Because exactly. they're exactly. they're a treat. And exactly. uh, okay, next question. She said, uh, <laughs> staying along the food food topic, uh, if you were a breakfast, what breakfast would you be, and why? This is funny because I'm sure we had breakfast together at Summit. So this is an interesting topic. Um, what kind of breakfast would I be? Um, I'd, I'd have to say an omelet. Okay. Um, just that perfect uh, that perfect meal all together, um, all the goodness in there, all the different things you like, bacon, onions, peppers, tomatoes, whatever you want in there, just all in one okay. meat package. And uh, she said... This is a well, challenging she, question. She said that she would totally be <laughs> waffles and cream and fruit. Oh, yes, that's yeah. definitely her. Yes. <laughs> that's outstanding. <laughs> that's outstanding. Um, so here's here's my question for you. What uh, I know why I do it, and I know what I what I enjoy out of it, but w- what why why do you why do you involve yourself so much in the community and and how did that start? Like, you know, cause I've seen you at so many conferences doing mm-hmm. all these sessions and, you know, you train on certifications and you do all kinds of stuff. How did that start and why mm-hmm. do you do it? Well, I've always loved to solve problems. I've, uh, anytime anyone needed help with a computer, with anything, I always like to hop in there and try help them in some way. And when I started off in customer support, this was a great opportunity for me to do that. But then those opportunities that I had where I could actually show them something new and to see people's eyes light up and go, oh, my gosh, that's it. That has saved me so much time. That is the most rewarding experience I think you can get is to know that you've helped Mm -hmm. somebody and made their day better. And I think when I moved into the training role and I did that more, I got to see the happiness instead of the, you know, Bless support people because Mm -hmm. it is a tough job. You get customers that are not happy, they're angry, they're frustrated, and you got to turn that around. And and I enjoyed that for a point, but when I can actually, you know, bring them even more joy with showing them the new features. And the CRM community is such a giving community that, you know, we're all out there to help people better utilize the software, make their processes better, make their lives better so they can just, you know, shut down at the end of the day, go home and, and live a life and not have to worry about business. And if we can find ways to help people work smarter, not harder, um, I'm all for that. I, I love to be a part of that and and share any information, any wisdom, you know, any war stories that I've had, just to help people not encounter some of the pain points that maybe I've experienced or other people have. Uh, it's all worth it to, to basically be an evangelist for this great product and and really just to help people. Well, you know, 
I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I think that is a perfect way to wrap this up. What do you think? Awesome. I think so. That's uh, I've had a lot of fun. I could definitely talk for hours and hours and days well, you know, about this. Um, but we, obviously we may we, just give you that opportunity. <laughs> we have we, to get back do, to our lives. We may, right? we may, uh, I, I don't think this is the last you're going to, you're going to hear the, uh, the diva on this particular podcast. So um, I think with that, I'll say thank you so much for, for coming on. And this was great. I had a lot of fun. This has probably been my favorite episode so far. Um, awesome. Well, thank you, Sean. You're always an easy person to talk to and, and uh, you, like me, just uh, just love to help. So exactly. this is even better. Exactly. So everybody out there listening, follow Sarah on Twitter. She's got a lot of good information to share at DYN365Diva. I got that right, right, Sarah? Okay. Yes, right. you got so it. At exactly Dyn365Diva. Right. Um, catch her at summits. Catch her at conferences. She's all over the place. And she's and her, her presentations are fantastic. So... Um, follow her on Twitter and as always you can follow me at CRM Hobbit or you can follow the podcast uh, network at CRM Audio and for Sarah this is Sean and as always we are at your service thanks at your service is a production of Dynamic Podcast LLC follow Sean on Twitter at CRM Hobbit subscribe to the CRM Audio network of podcasts on Apple Podcasts Google Play Music, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, or any place else that fine podcasts are available. You can email us at voice at crm.audio. Thanks again to our sponsors, Kingswaysoft and Alexa CRM.